you want to keep it light. You don't want to have a black gash across there. Yeah, again, everything is thought of in terms of color spots and, oh, yes. and not what their anatomical function is. I think that many beginning artists would have a tendency to uh, <clears throat> look at a portrait in a way that they might a drawing. That is to place a line that represents the mouth and outline the eyes and outline the nose. And uh, you are left later in the drawing to shade and create form. But in your approach to painting, by laying down color spots, it is the form that defines what would be lines in another painting or, or a drawing. Yes, well, I consider this a much easier approach. It's not that the other can't possibly be used and may be valid, but uh, I think why go to all of that trouble when you can work in this way and have the thing appear almost magically, really. It's just a lot easier, and the business of the artist is to be efficient. So it's one, one, one point, anyway, that's, I think, important, because, again, if you have a model who's sitting for you, you don't want to keep the person there forever and ever, and the person may very well not be willing to sit. So, and if you're working outside, if you're working on a landscape, which of course is uh, different conditions, but this, the approach is the same, you need to work quickly because you're working with changing light. Well, this is fortunate. We have a captive uh, sitter and captive light. <laughs> yeah. And that gives us quite a bit of leeway. It does. Not, not much subtlety in the color here yet, but... Uh, that if we if we uh, go into that it'll be later on that just develops as you work along So I noticed when you began this Aww. that you were very careful about setting up your, your light on Richard. Yeah. And uh, I, as you develop the painting here, I can see what, um, what the value of that has been for dramatic contrasts. Yes. Well, actually, without the light, if you remember, before we set the light up, there was no contrast, practically none. Mm -hmm. it, the, everything was flat. There was no interest. Light is as much a subject of a painting as whatever you're painting. And it can bring a great deal of drama to a painting, more than anything else can. That was why Rembrandt and the uh, Dutch people were so keen on chiaroscuro, which is, simply means light dark. Well, one of the, their techniques were to start a painting um in black and white, didn't they? And then they overpainted their flesh tones? Or? I honestly don't know. Uh -huh. it, it makes sense. Yeah. But I, I really don't know how they worked. But to go right into the, we talked about that in the beginning, that to go into the darks is a big help because uh, somehow it's easy enough to get lights, but if you don't start off with a good deep, dark, you may have the rest of your canvas entirely out of whack in value. Value is the light-dark relationship. Uh, a lot of painters use about nine values, or they, they consider there to be about nine values that are practical to, to work with from light to dark. There's light, medium, and dark are the three basic ones. Between those are what are called half tones, and they simply are halfway between light and medium and dark and medium. So then you're 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 using you're using basically how many values? Three values? Well, the three basic values, and then you might say that there are another. I don't know. In half tones, there's a halfway between light and dark. Halfway between dark. 
rather light and medium and dark mm -hmm. and medium. Uh, actually, probably a couple of tones on either side of that. And then there are highlights and accents. Highlights are your lightest lights, accents are your darkest darks. Usually you can find lightest lights and darkest darks to somewhere near the focus of the painting. Uh, usually that's true particularly of the light. Sometimes you carry the darks out a lot further because they will bring out the lights mm -hmm. and the other values in the painting. So if you have a dark background, you may, might make the thing almost, uh, almost black. So the foundation of your painting, the way you start would be in your darkest values, and uh, yet you don't have black on your, your palette. Why no. is that? Why do you prefer to work without black? I prefer to, to mix what amounts to a black, but uh, has a little color in it. Now, I just think there's more, there are artists, very fine artists, who use black. Sargent once asked Monet how on earth he could paint without black, but uh, I don't use it. And a lot of the, the Impressionists generally did not use it. Mm -hmm. So I think Manet must have. But uh, you, you just get a little bit more variety of color. Also, you can make it warmer or cooler if you're not using it. A straight black. Would Do you, you feel that black, um, as a darkening agent, destroys the color? It neutralizes oh, yes. the color. Yeah. Well, I, I know the same thing happen color. happens with uh, white, in uh, in an effort to lighten the painting. It's a very common error I see with beginning oh, yeah. painters. It can become very chalky and ineffective. But you have to use white. But uh, you use as much chroma, which is you know concentrated pigment, as you can and white dilutes it. That's another reason for not starting off with your lightest values. You go into the darks where you're using no, you start off with darks in which you're using no white to dilute it. So you have richer, richer colors in the darks. One of the uh, problems for beginning painters is getting brilliance in a painting, bringing things out enough. And frequently, they try to do it by mixing color with white to make it lighter, to make it brighter. But the thing is that brilliance, drama, depend on contrast. So if you simply try to make things brighter by adding white, making them lighter, you're going to end up with something very pallid unless you take into account the opposite, the darks. The darks give a good sound foundation to a painting. The light shows up against the dark. Everything in painting is contrast. Light against dark is probably the, the most important of all. Uh, in colors, warm against cool. For instance, here on the face, the cheek color is warm, the flesh color is warm. Against a cool tone in the green of the couch behind it, those two contrast very nicely. Sometimes when you have a large area of paint also, you deliberately break it, into, break it down into warms and cools so that you get more interest within it. It does create interest and uh, if it's all in the same value, the change in color is not obvious. Uh, Charles Webster Hawthorne, in his book, for instance, told a student, paint this weather-beaten old barn so that the person seeing it will say it's a weather-beaten old barn, and only you will know it's purple. Whoops. <laughs> Whoops. Uh, in this section of the sweater, which is a rather large expanse of the same, pretty much the same value, I'm trying 
to indicate the light part of it, not by a deep contrast in light and dark, because if you squint at that sweater, the lights and the darks are almost the same value. But in this case, by contrasting warm with cool, what I'm doing is I'm mixing alizarin crimson with ultramarine blue and a little cobalt blue and some white. Not too much white because I don't want to make it really light, but alizarin crimson and ultramarine blue will give you a very, very rich, deep black, and we don't want that either. Uh, actually, you also have to remember, be careful with alizarin crimson. Alizarin crimson is not that stable, stable a color and should not be used with medium, so I don't mix turpentine with it. Why is that, Sue? It can, with age, turn black, is what I've been mm -hmm. told or what I've read. Mm, how much aging would that be? Oh, I don't know. I don't uh, within know. our lifetime? I have no idea. I mean, I read this, I think, in uh, Max Dörner, Materials of the Artist. Mm -hmm. Again, uh, some of these pigments have changed and are not made with the same stuff that they were when Dörner was writing, so I'm not sure what does and doesn't apply. Mm -hmm. But I'm, I just stay careful with alizarin. In fact, I often don't use it. What do you substitute? Well, if I have a good cadmium red deep, I use that. Alizarin is almost a new color for me to use. I used to use cadmium red deep and cadmium red light. Uh, lately, I've had a little difficulty getting a good cadmium red deep, and I've substituted uh, cadmium red le <laughs> cadmium red medium for the two of them. But that doesn't work quite as well for some of the uh, mixtures. It's not quite pure enough. Well, that's a nice touch. That bit of light on the edge of the collar. Yes. That well, that's there. Well, and, it, uh, it, yes, I can see it. <laughs> <laughs> You know, there have been slight uh, changes. What the, the person seeing this is not aware of is that there have been breaks in which Dick has gotten up and moved around, and there are just slight subtle changes uh, when he has sat back down. And so the light on the collar, positions of fingers, you know, they're just a little, a little different. And where it's better, I take it into account and mm -hmm. use it. We may have mentioned this before, but when you squint down, not at your painting, but at your subject, it darkens everything, simplifies everything, gives you a better idea of what values are. If you use the values that you see when you squint, you'll get quite an accurate uh, representation. You then paint them with, with, with your eyes open but trying to get that effect on the canvas. It, your eyes also put everything a little bit out of focus, so you don't have sharp focus all over the place. Normally, when you look at something, of course, you're focusing on one point anyway, which is, to my mind, the thing that's wrong with sharp focus painting. It has an even focus over the entire picture, and you don't see that way. Just working here with half tones, again establishing what amount to details, but not through line, through darkening this and lightening that. This uh, what I'm going to do here is an example of, if it works out, an accent. Well, it's not so, not so good. I think I need to lighten the nose just a little bit here. Not that much. getting it too light. I 
I'm using cobalt blue and terra rosa and no white in this to get a little bit warmer shadow than I had and a little bit lighter without going too pale. This is one of the joys of uh, painting an oil suit is that it's a very forgiving medium. Oh yes it is. Uh, watercolor, for instance, is, is not, and I find it very difficult since I don't have that immediate sort of control over things. I'm going to use a palette knife to put in the accent under the nose. So I need to make that darker, yeah. Okay, so I'll put in a little alizarin. We need to work around that a bit. When you paint, you're working with the surrounding area as much as you are with the uh, with the subject that you're, you're painting or the color spot. Each color spot affects another. If you put down a warm next to a coal, it will bring out the, 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 uh, the coal and the warm of each. And if you put a light next to a dark, each one will seem more emphatic. So is this a very conscious thing when you're working, that if you've laid down an intense uh, cold, that you would put a, a, a light warm next to it to heighten that That you contrast? might. You might do something like that near the focus, only, of course, if it's there to begin with. I mean, you have to have some indication of it. You can't just make it up because it would it would be a contrast if it's not there in some form it's going to look very odd mm -hmm. this is too light half tone again just here under the nose where the light goes over a bit This is the sort of thing where you can go on more or less till doomsday getting getting the effects of half tones. Yeah, but each time you do, the head becomes a little bit more modeled. Provided I get it right. I've been this one I'm getting a little bit too dark, too warm. Here we go. Mm -hmm. This is a matter of edges, and edges really are value. Now there's a, a difference here. The ear is quite warm. The line of the face coming down next to the ear, though the same value, is a little cooler. Mm -hmm. So we'll mix, again, we'll mix a little blue with terra rosa and this time with white. Uh, with the blue just slightly predominating. We may have it too, we have it too light. We're working under a rather harsh light here. It's not always right, easy to see what your value is before it hits the canvas. There we go. This is this is a little closer, a little better. Mm. But it's still too light, still yeah, considerably yeah, too light. So we'll just go at it again and darken it. Do you find it easy to paint over <clears throat> a color as opposed to wiping it off and replacing it? Uh, yeah, I usually don't wipe off. If I painted more thickly, I think I would have to. I'm not advocating thin painting, and this isn't really thin either, but uh, it's not impasto. So usually I don't, I don't, uh, never got in the habit somehow of wiping paint off. Once in a while you have to. Never quite seen the advantage of impasto painting. <clears throat> the idea that more paint makes for a better painting. Only texturally in some cases. Mm -hmm. That's, uh, I like knife painting because you can get 
really lovely effects, but that's not really thick, thick impasto either. I've seen a few things where it was very effective. I've seen a lot of things where it also wasn't. I've seen a lot of really bad acrylic painting which had nothing to say for itself except that it was impasto. One other way of softening the edges other than painting half tones is to run a palette knife through them. You do this carefully and gently so that you do not destroy all your underpainting. And you'll have to come back and build some of it up again. But it does give, or can give, a nice effect, a softening effect. And then you, you work it back and forth until you're satisfied with it. Do it carefully there, not to remove all of that accent. Well, Sue, if that was impasto, it's no impasto no more. <laughs> well, it was not impasto. Actually, I'm probably going to use the knife. I used it here also mm -hmm. to flat.